So the the impetus of this discussion is uh, for the like three of you that don't know is Fat Shark has announced a major expansion for Vermintide 2. And this is on the heels of a few months ago, the CEO mentioning that they plan on supporting this game for, no kidding, quote, years, right? So we're like, okay, so what does supporting for years mean? Do we just mean like rolling map DLCs? Or do you mean you're going to really throw out something that really expands the game? And the answer is clear. They plan on blowing this game up even more. So they're calling it an expansion, not a DLC, because one, we're going from... Skaven in V1, to Skaven and Chaos in V2, to Skaven, Chaos, and Beastmen, right? So there's going to be a huge expansion there. And they're also talking about range units, not specials, range units for the first time. Awesome. But put that on the side for a second, because what we really want to talk about is the other thing that they've been... The CEO of Fat Shark has wanted, since basically before release, to have an end game in this game, something like what Griffs are for uh, Diablo 3, if you're familiar. An end game, um, like scaling thing that gets harder and harder is to give people an opportunity to test their skills and a reason to keep getting better and better, right? Um, Last Stand ended up being what they did in V1, but it's not what they really wanted. They wanted something that was more vermin tidy. And the way they're trying to do it is Winds of Magic. So the basic idea is they're going to take chunks of maps, and there's going to be, they're going to be called weaves, right? And I think there'll be multiple weaves in a run, but I'm not sure. And each weave is going to have a chunk of a map, which can be a normal V2 map. There might be new stuff, we don't know, but right now they're talking about current V2 maps, but changed in some way. There's going to be a wind, which you can think of as a mutator, right? And the one they mention is the Jade Wind, which constantly heals you, but makes taking, like, doing damage to them cost your HP. Uh, there'll be an objective, which could be something really lame, like kill X number of type a, or it could be a well watch type objective of survive while making so sure they don't kill you know, some area, or it could be something cooler. We don't know yet, but that's just what they've mentioned here in this article. Um, after you go through a couple wins, there'll be a finale, which presumably is like a harder weave, like maybe multiple bosses or something. Um, and the idea is that they're going to be handcrafted, and that, that's a big key right here, handcrafted, and they're going to get harder and harder. So we wanted to have this discussion. We wanted to go back to Vermintide 1 because we wanted to talk about ways that Vermintide 1 made the game harder other than just adding more and more units or upscaling HP and damage. Do you guys really want to go into why those aren't a great thing to go on infinitely or just put that for another day? Bullet, sponge, no fun. Yeah, bullet, sponge, no fun. Like Death Wish, if you've played the mod, is already at the upper limit of bullet spongy in my opinion. Yeah, you can't just yeah. keep going. I don't and you, play much Deathwish personally because I don't like the way it modifies the stagger values in Cleave. It's like uh, just really counterintuitive. Plus, it would be very hard to learn, right? Because you'd have to learn the feeling of everything differently every time you went up a weave. But anyways, okay, so put that aside. You can't upscale damage numbers and HP like you can in Diablo 3. You can't just crank a dial and make the game more interesting. The other dial you can't crank ad infinitum is spawn rates. One, they're trying to make it so it works for consoles, guys. And console CPUs are the weak point of consoles, not the GPU, the CPU. Um, and two, Onslaught, Grimm's mod, again, there's Deathwish and Grimm, uh, Grimm's Onslaught. Those are the two things we're thinking of most when we think of upping difficulty. Already up tweaks spawn numbers. It already up tweaks the composition of a horde to include you know, everything but the biggest thing. So the Chaos Horde is everything but Chaos Warriors. The Skaven Horde has everything but monks. Um, and they've already up tweaked all the mods. So, like, that's cool. Up tweaking spawns is cool, and it leads to good stuff, but you can't do that at infinitum either. Uh, do we agree on this point, too? Yeah. Yeah. Because CPUs just burn in hell, then. So what we're left with, handicaps, mutators, those might be roughly the same thing, and objectives. And what I want to talk about today is objectives, and I want to stop talking for, like, at least five minutes. So somebody who wants to take the wheel on this... Let me, yeah, let me jump in in between because I think it's really interesting to talk about what I know you're going to talk about in terms of objectives. Um, I'm, I'm simultaneously thrilled and dismayed by some of the language around the weaves. And for me, this comes back to what I see the, the whole uh, beating heart of Vermintide for me, which is that it's like playing Dungeons and Dragons in a kind of peculiar way. We only have, whatever it is, 15 or 16 adventures that we keep running, but the AI director keeps it fresh. You don't know, you know which race you're going to play on the first half of the map. You don't know when the boss is going to spawn. And it doesn't sound like much, but it's enough. 
you know, that for me, it boils down to chaos. I don't know what's coming with pals and often pals I haven't met yet. You know, I just hop onto quick play, got some random dudes pretending to be elves and we, uh, we bang out an adventure or two. I like it. That's what, that's what I do in this game. And for me, every time Fat Shark deviates from that, uh, that core formula um, by scripting things, for example, the holdout in the warehouse on uh, the pit, I think is maybe, oh, it's, it's among the examples where they all the spawns are scripted. And for me, I think I'm, I'm almost done having fun the third time I play that. It's, it's lost the unpredictability and element of surprise that I'm looking for in the game. Um, and conversely, most of what I play Vermintide through these days is um, public Twitch games because I love how that cranks up the unpredictability. I love having a boss in the finale of Righteous Stand instead of, you know, what it normally is, which is deadly boring, you know, like, I don't, it doesn't take very long before you can solo it. You know, you don't need your teammates. You can just run around like a headless chicken. Yeah, you but always know what's coming next. Yeah, and it's not even that challenging. So Fortunes of War it is a different situation because it's very challenging. Very, very challenging. It's, you know, it's only been soloed with Invisible Heroes so far, I think. Um, but it is totally scripted. And... It's it's it, it it doesn't have much fun factor for me because of that. Um, yeah, I so thought, like last stand in the first game, which was also scripted. Also, all largely. scripted. Yeah, I think that's I think that's kind of the kiss of death for fun for me. Um, yeah, because it's like you, you figure out how to do it like a couple of times, and then you're sort of done with it. Yeah, and do you remember when a river on the what is it? Right, right, river. You know the the, the rafting. Leave one. The, leave the storm yeah. vermin alive to make the event easier. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. As soon as someone hacks the scripts and figures out how to cheese it, it feels bad to not cheese it, and it feels bad to cheese it. Yep. And now you're just the, having you've no got fun. the pressure. You've got dissonance from both parties. You want the team that's just there to get loot as quickly as possible, so wants to exploit the game, versus the people who actually want to have fun. Yeah, and even that's sometimes the same person in me, right? So it's the end of the get map. I don't want to. I, I would like some loot, but should I deliberately pull? You know, obviously I, I like pulling patrols and taking everything in the face if I can. That's kind of the fun, but it's it, it it sets up a tension that doesn't need to be there. So so when I heard about the weaves and I heard the word handcrafting, I got worried. So that's that's kind of one of my biggest concerns is that fat shark lean into its core strength of building this kind of dungeon master that gives us really cool adventures to play. I can see reasons for doing a seated mode, for example, if we do have a global leaderboard where you, you kind of want things to be comparable. But I think that's a tangent. And I think the core of the game is dynamic, random uh, adventures with pals. Um, now, the other thing I wanted to jump onto there was mutators, winds, weaves. Do you want to do you want to address that? I heard I heard an intake of breath. Not from me, buddy. You keep going. Okay. All right. I'll keep rolling. So the topic again now is. Is yeah, I'm shifting. So that one was uh, keep it crazy. Don't script it. I think that's that's really the core game. Um, and I worry if, if we stray from Sigmar's grace in that way. Okay, um, the other I, one is the mutators, weaves... Okay, yeah, yeah, now you have something. Go for it. No, no, no. I just wanted to make sure I'm summarizing. So we like that the game... You can, ha you can get enough game sense in this game that you can get a hunch of what's happening and learn how to react to situations in general. But if you could play the same map 50 times and kind of have a significantly different... I, I, when I walk into this area of the map, what I tend to expose myself to here is this, this, and this. But every once in a while, you get this, 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 and that, and it becomes interesting again because you have a puzzle to solve, right? Yeah, it's, it's I love not... it when every Go now ahead. and then I get a group that drops down at the top of the finale of Screaming Bell, and they were like, oh, that was a lot of mugs. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You get ganked by 20 monks just after the drop down and everyone's dead. You know? Because you, you can't just jump off blindly 
and be guaranteed success. You okay. need to be paying attention. Yeah. So AI director is a core strength. Ahead, no, no, no. AI director is a core strength. That's it. He's transcribing into his uh, <laughs> his, his notes, notes doc. Okay, go ahead. What's your next? <laughs> what's your next he is big your one? your secretary. What's your next big one? <laughs> I've I've done the same for him. So here's the other thing: uh, the mutators, the weaves, the what was the other thing? Handicaps. I I'm a little bit concerned, and I, I'm going to take Twitch as the as a signature example here. So Twitch was a wild idea, I think, at the start. I mean, it was it was in at release, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was to totally out in left field. Like, what if streamers could interact with their audiences and have that show up in the game? It was wild. Um, and I think, to the to Fat Shark's credit, I think it really did work well as something to do with your viewers. I always just plug into a channel called Impact Wrestling because I can remember that, and it's 24-7. And then I just want the chaos, right? So I don't have any viewers. Um, to me, it just it's just another mutator. I want chaos every 30 seconds or whatever. Um, but then you have the deeds, which are mutators locked behind consumables that can't you can't match make for. And now we might have map chunks and wins. I would like to see Fat Shark back away from creating a curated next level end game experience and lean towards just throwing all those Legos in a box and sliding it our way and saying, see what you can figure out with this. Go! Okay. Because so I'm, I'm worried that something like uh, Leaves is going to end up kind of further balkanizing the mutators we already have on the table. And I would like to see what the community could figure out um, is the great, the fun way to play Vermintide. As I mentioned, right now I mostly host Twitch with pubs, and I say, "Hey guys, welcome. We're playing Twitch. No viewers. Let's have some fun." Because that's the mutator I, I I have the most fun with. So pause. I could see that as long as we could label our lobbies, for example, it doesn't. So people could kind of invent the combinations that they find the most fun, um, and let people, you know, unleash their creativity with it. I'm I'm worried that if if Fat Shark try to figure out what the best way to play Vermintide is, it's not going to be as efficient at delivering fun to the players, essentially. So I'd like to see the mutators just kind of get harmonized instead of being split into this is Twitch mode and that's Deeds and this is Weaves, kind of collect them in the middle, uh, figure out some basic, sensible way to connect that to the loot system. It doesn't have to be hyper generous or hyper stingy, but keep those two things coupled so that people don't feel like they have to choose between progress and, and fooling around. And um, yeah, so I, I, I still think it could be fun to see what Fetrick come up with as, as a curated option, but also I'd like to see them keep moving towards letting us figure out what's fun. Okay, so I think Paul. if I were to summarize both of the things you're saying, <laughs> You worry about yeah. over-defining what... Yeah, I do kind of share your sentiment. I don't want to knock wins until we know what it is, though. Of course. Yeah, and before I sound like I'm... Well, pause. We're not knocking any... On the parade yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think uh, JSAS preamble was really cool, right? This I is This did. could be the scalable endgame. I agree with that. And I absolutely the love I the myself, idea so I of shut up map and talk. Especially ones that you can run backwards sometimes. It's for the best. You know, yeah. shut up and let them talk. I think you can get so much value out of um, those kinds of mutators just because they multiply the possible experiences you can have. Just just beastmen, right? A third race. Yeah. Now now the combos explode. We can have just one. We can have you know four different combinations. Those can be switched up with map chunks. It could keep the game fresh for a really long time. So I think they're absolutely heading in the right direction. All right, sorry, back to you. Back to you, Alec. It's for I the best that have... I muted myself two minutes ago so I could let you keep talking. So, <laughs> so Zero, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut up again. I'm going to literally mute myself again and let Zero jump in here. No, I didn't really have much to say. Start babbling then. And then pass it off to Sneaky. I had something, but honestly, I forgot it. Just... Just go. All right. All right. Well, let me uh, summarize then two of the things that you're saying so far. So the first, the first 
is you're worried about handcrafting means staleness, right? And the next you're worried about what you're using the word curating, but let's just define our terms here. I think what you mean by that is them defining every aspect of what the end game is. At the next weave, it's exactly these map slices where you'll get exactly these things, where you'll get exactly these mutators. You're making the end game experience, you're taking away the potential of modularity, right? Of people being able to pick, let me take increased spawn rates of something, something from here and this type of mutator and you know this map and put them together and see what that does because they're going to do all of that for us and take that away and it's kind of fun to be able to control the experience to a degree let me let me devil's advocate for it for a second okay the devil's yep. advocate for it is we already have a lot of powers like that in mod realm we've had spawn tweaks for forever how many parties gone in and defined their own challenge i think most people don't actually try to cater you know the experience they don't try to like build their own experience they i think the mo the vast majority of people just play whatever is is built in stock just for the sake of i don't know authenticity yep yeah i think very few people actually play on the modded realm yeah, we, I think... we've had this conversation before right we yep. the convention terms yep the... that's exactly yeah, so the term that's the that's the hidden that's the elephant in the room is that if you throw people into modded realm and say you can do everything you want and it doesn't count and the points don't matter or whatever the phrase is it it loses uh its savory taste so but let's put it together in a different way what you're worried about is staleness right and and novel losing novelty so, so there's two things the reason i said curated the reason I said curated is because, you know, I, I imagine our, our, our friends at, at Fat Shark putting their heads together and brainstorming what would be a really cool new way to play. And I think that's valuable. At the same time, I think it's the amount of creativity even those, you know, competent dudes can muster pales in comparison to what the community can and will produce when uh when they're allowed to you know out, not just in watered realm so what it like if twitch wasn't so weird if i don't have to say hey you can do it too just type in impact wrestling into your box right like and, and if it was connected to the loot instead of it being just well you get some loot die if it was harmonized with the main game i think people would be all over twitch as it, just with the features it has now or the the twitch what i call the mutator of twitch um and then they might be combining that with deeds, which a lot of people do, and, and knowing which ones are the best combos that are the most fun. So I think that's that's the kind of creativity and discovery that I'm trying to hope, I'm hoping is um, enabled. And I find like I've, I've heard some language from Fat Shark about you know we're worried we want to we want to keep our hands on the levers of the challenge buttons I, I think and that's what i why i say curated it seems like they want to make sure that players have kind of a predictable experience when they show up you know in in public quick play which is an understandable concern i think um and yet this is again one of those moments where i i, I want to advocate for kind of just trusting the player base to okay pause have fun yeah, go ahead. I, I, listening to you, it, it came clear to me that there's two different things that this kind of um, Winds of Magic thing could serve. One could be that kind of linear, getting harder, sh proving to yourself you can do something hard, and apples to apples comparison with other people that we've, uh, for a lot of good reasons, a lot of people have wanted in Vermintide for a long time, right? And in some ways, Last Stand was that, but Last Stand has a lot of huge mm. problems with it that we can talk about. Mm. But yep. at the same time, you don't want to always play that, just like you don't always play Fortunes of War, right? Because it's, it becomes stale. So what I'm hearing from you is maybe, maybe, they need to take these new pieces, they're, they need to take these new toys they're, they're making, right? And yes, they should put them together in a linear way to do this kind of challenge, pro linear progression challenge thing they're talking about. But at the same time, maybe they also need to create an almost an AI director for putting together a series of weaves that are novel and somewhat randomized and maybe even seeded so you could, uh, I guess in Mod Realm we'd make it seeded so you could pull up the same seed twice or whatever. Or you could just handcraft it 
and we get crazy mode name here, take the various new things brought in through Winds of Magic, maps, mutators, whatever, and recombine them in a series of a random series of weaves, novel series of weaves. Yeah, absolutely. With, that's with exactly loot. what I'm saying. With so loot. You, you don't have to do just one, Fat Shark. We can do two. We like the linear progression, show, show us what you got kind of thing. But at the same time, we want a mode that we can play over and over again that doesn't get stale. And one of the lessons of Vermintide is randomness, significant variance, but within a range that's somewhat learnable, leads to really cool, long, 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 long learning curves. And thousands of hours of game time. Very cool. Okay. So is there any other big picture thing you want to do? Because I know you got family today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Well, I loot. I was going to say, I've got two hobby horses. Loot's the other one, I think. Oh, God. I didn't want to do this, but I'll let you. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, so it's, it's just the same thing. You know, if you say, sure, we, we can do that, we'll put it in modded realm. It's, it's now you've, you've turned a hard corner and, and it, it gets a, it's a lonely place. Um, I think you just need, it doesn't need to be perfect out of the gate, whether it's, you know, generous enough or too stingy. Uh, for example, if you have this new system that lets people keep playing and keep digging even deeper and deeper into the mastery of the game and is fresh in all these new ways because of, you know, if they throw in this expansion and then a year from now we get another expansion and it just gets getting deeper and deeper, that's fantastic. That's exactly what I want out of the game. Just Just keep it hooked up to the to the loot engine it does it, it that's really important i think for it to stay to have its potential unlocked by the players because the players will you know make a, a pained face when they have to say oh okay and so no progress it, it's it's a really big ask i think so i won't go into it anymore okay than then i will always give the other side of that coin because there are two sides of this coin guys and the, this is all about the vanilla realm mod realm distinction the first side of the coin is even though players desire the unique and ever scaling play experience available in the mod realm giving it up means giving something up and people hate to lose right people hate to lose people would rather it doesn't matter we don't have to go into the distinction that's one side of the coin that pyro talked about the other side of the coin is we have a lot of really talented modders and really hardcore people in the community that are very creative and want to work with those modders to make new experiences but god it's got to be really hard to be motivated to make those things when only a couple maybe 100 or 200 people are going to see them out of the tens of twenties of thousands of people out there I need Fat Shark to throw us a goddamn bone already. It's been too long. Throw us a bone. Show us that you're willing to take the modding community serious, seriously and take cool stuff and bring it into the core game. Do it. Do it. Yeah. yeah. So that's I, absolutely true. And I, I can hear uh, Exan, Exanta in my mind already saying, and for the console players, right? If it stays in modded realm and never gets to the main game, consoles players are totally left out in the cold. Hmm. Can I expand on that, actually? Please. Yeah, go ahead. There, there are just, like, hundreds of very passionate modding people, right? People who make original content for the game for free and then troubleshoot it and fix it whenever it gets broken and sort out all the bugs. And it's just, it's, it's several thousand hours worth of free labor and end game replayability and fresh content that could be tapped into that just isn't quite being utilized how it could you know it it is it is literally just free labor and i know that it's quite as simple as copy and paste the mod code into the game right you do have to do some tweaking but you know compared to coming up with your own content from scratch or making a new map or something like that comparatively the effort to just you know make the tweaks necessary to actually make the modded content in the game, like Onslaught, you know, is a lot less. And I, I feel like that could be utilized a lot better. And ultimately, the the end game, late game content, what's going to keep the game alive is the, the modding community. Okay. Right. Can I extend on this even more? And No. Let me, can I jump in and then I'm going to bow up. out? Yes, please. You go first. <laughs> what I'm, what it's coming to my mind here is that uh, the loot thing again. I, I think maybe what would be really valuable is if Fat Shark could come up with a framework for loot that modders can access. So how does loot work? 
you get die, it gets you extra rolls, you know, but like, what if there was a formal framework where you can kind of keep tweaking up uh, the potential reward of something or down or whatever it is. Um, but there's only one way to do it. So there's like a, a mod framework for delivering loot. And then you work it out. So if so, if, if players say this is clearly too lucrative, you know, death wish, instant red with no books, it's too lucrative. I felt like in Vermintide 1 where it was, where it gave you the two free grims, I think, that was finally a sweet spot for me. I felt like it was really hard, uh, at least at the beginning, pulling off Death Wish. And I was happy that half the time I got a red out of it. It, it didn't feel too lucrative. But if there was a official framework for varying how rewarding um, gameplay could be, and if you could just keep, you know, in my mind, you throw in Back to Basics and Vanguard and um, Jade Wind and Twitch, you deserve some serious loot at the end. Why not? If you can get that good, that means you've got 600 hours, 700 hours in the game. You know, um, scale the loot. If, so maybe Fat Shark could take that on and formalize that, and then you'd have a bridge that could be depended on to the end of the, the game's life. Okay. I'm out of time. I'll leave you with that. Enjoy this your family, up. man. Thank you for stopping in. Have fun, guys. Bye-bye. Everybody say goodbye. Right, see ya. Pog. See ya. Okay. I got that down. That was a great idea. Okay. So back to what Panda was saying. Panda was emphasizing that there are hundreds of people out there willing to put effort out there and they're not being utilized, blah, blah, blah. Let's go even a step further. They've promised Map Editor. I know they sent resources on mobilizing Map Editor, right? Okay, making whole maps from scratch. These Vermintide maps are very complicated things. I don't see how reasonable that is short term. You know what is pretty reasonable short term? And it also a great bridge between having no know-how of how to make Vermintide maps and more know-how is modifying existing ones in interesting ways. Adding scaffolding yes. here so there's a new pathway. Adding a custom event here where you have that's mo you go to one one map. You go to Engines of War and you find the code determining how you do the barrels, the barrel event, right? And you just Oof. move that crap, move that crap into another part of like the um, one of the different scenes in Garden of More and boom really interesting gameplay not that much effort learning opportunity for modders scalable new content to go into winds of war yeah that's a great idea i know you it's an actual five like uh, you could edit the map to make it go in reverse or something change the events around you, you basically have a new map can add events new pathing Different spawn spots, yeah. etc. I feel like something like that would ultimately have to be community curated rather than developer curated. Yeah, a, a picture like just a voting system. You know, yes, you'd have a very you'd have maps that are really popular because the community endorses them by voting them up or something like that on the workshop. Right. Yeah, but, I do wish you know, it were easier to get. Uh, to get stuff from the modded realm to the live realm. Like gameplay changing stuff basically isn't gonna make it through with the current rules, which I think is a real shame because a lot of the gameplay affecting mods add a ton of replayability like Onslaught or Mythic Vanguard or whatever. I yeah, I wonder if part of their hesitation is I remember and I don't really have any strong feelings about this, but I remember back in Vermintide 1, certain people would, you know, tell new players, oh, if you just turn on, like, Deathwish Onslaught Stormgrim Mutation, you can basically just kite past everything and, you know, get, like, five five Grim Dice for free. It's, it's a great way to just speed farm loot. So I'm, I'm wondering if part of their concern is, like, people finding combinations that should make the game harder but allow you certain uh, sort of, like, cheese strategies to just easy speed farm stuff. But I mean, I don't really care about that personally. But that might be something Fat Shark is gonna hold out on. Yeah, I th think they're probably too worried about that. 
I think they're probably more worried with people making their game no longer authentic by making silly stuff like uh, Macho Man Randy Savage Ogres and uh, Shrek's Swamp Map, you know. Horn of right. Magnet that's Minecraft never, no, 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 edition. No, 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 no. None of that's going to be whitelistable you know. at all. None of that's whitelistable at all. It has to be with That is a worry, I suppose. No, no, it's, it's not even that. I don't, I don't even... They're <laughs> like not, it's if not even, you can add assets from the outside, you know, that's kind of a big... Not That's only a big can of worms. Not True. only can you not put that stuff in whitelisting, the IP is not allowed. I don't even think you're allowed to put that on the workshop. If the last I recall when Robin was talking <laughs> about this, it's not even allowed on the on the workshop. So like it's funny for a lull and maybe a modder will be able to load it up on their current, but they won't be able to distribute it. So I think it's like a yeah. non worry. But I, I get where yeah. you're going. I actually, but I do think, hold on, like the crazy weird IP stuff's not non worry, but the making the game feel weird kind of thing is probably a legitimate thing. Yeah, it's not even, right. that, it, that was a bit over the top, obviously, to paint my point a little more clearly. But yeah, there's certainly smaller things you could do. Um, like, for instance, yeah. uh, so one thing that I'm picturing already is uh, jumping puzzles. Like, for, in, for instance, in, uh, in Halo back on. Uh, on the Xbox, when I was, you know, like 18, the when you could spawn items like assets into the map live, what people would do was they would make like giant jumping puzzles that would take like three hours to do out of like doors or something, you know. So there'd be like, you know, there would be maps that are just like ammo box staircase jump puzzles or some crap like that. That that's gonna be a thing. Yeah, you know, and they probably don't like that either because it's like it's not a platformer, you know. So there's a lot of ways that they, you know, just giving that power to the player uh, too much is gonna r remove the authenticity of their of their game or whatever. So I can see it's it, yeah. Just given how careful Fat Shark is in general with their decision making, I I I, I find this will be a really tough one to push. You know, there's I still think ahead. they. Uh, I still think they could go a little further. There's there could be a sweet spot uh, for what mods could be allowed. I really think stuff like onslaught uh, would be beneficial to have on the live realm. Whereas, I don't know, Shrek's swamp probably wouldn't be. Okay, I need to moderate. I need to moderate this conversation because I know we're going to be on the downside soon to go get some food. And there's something mm -hmm. I really wanted to discuss today, and we have not gotten to it at all. All right, go ahead. So we know kind of how mutators can make for interesting experiences, and you can always come up with new stuff, etc. But the thing that I don't see really mentioned there in the announcement, and the thing that I wanted to go back to Vermintide 1.4 to talk about, is you can up spawns, right? And you can make the individual spawns tougher in some way. And that'll make the game harder, but it's kind of, and it will change how the game feels, but you know, you, you only can scale that so much. But one of the ways that Vermintide 1 made a lot of part of the, a lot of the game interesting is making the events require different types of gameplay than the ordinary game itself. And things come to mind, like we just did the barrel event on Kazid Crow and the barrel yeah. event on Kazid Crow is very interesting. For those of you who did not play Vermintide 1, the way it works, is there's like a central hub and three spokes and barrels will spawn explosive barrels that have a timer on them you can't break them the normal way you get in vermintide by hitting them but they're timed barrels and they will spawn every so often in the main hub and then you have to dash so you've got to kind of clear and time it in such a way that you can dash down the, the spoke and dump that barrel into a pit to blow up a spawn spot. And then there's another wave and you gotta fight your way back. So the very nature of this event requires more timing and coordinating where you're going to go and moving as a unit. Now you don't have to move under unit as much, under very much pressure, but you do have to move. And that in and of itself is a whole nother tactical, strategic, whatever you wanna call it, element that you don't see as much in the default game. And it leads to really interesting gameplay. So what I wanted right. to talk about is how we can scale difficulty, add new ways of playing that are interesting and such by looking backwards to think about the events that worked well in V1, kind of contrast them to what's going on in V2, and maybe make some brief comments on what they could do with Winds of Magic. Because, the, let me just finish prefacing, 
Winds of Magic is intentionally supposed to test you. It's supposed to be new ways to play. It's supposed to push you. It's supposed to be you have to push and coordinate as a team. And my, what I want to open up to immediately is let's contrast V1, V2 at a high level and ask ourselves, how did we get to V2 events given how good some of V1 events were? Go. So generally speaking, people take the path of least resist and the maps that actually do require team coordination generally don't get played very much, such as Summoner's Peak or uh, Dungeons or, you know, objective-based well, maps are particularly troublesome for players as well because they require, they, they give the team the option to go in different directions or grab different barrels or sacks in different order. So I think maybe what might have happened was... Uh, Fat Shark saw that people weren't playing these maps that did require team coordination, uh, and they decided, well, the, that means the player doesn't like them, and we shouldn't uh, shouldn't include them. But I mean, that's just kind of uh, speculating. Um, do you remember Oops. at oh, pause? Do you remember at Fat Shark where they mentioned, and I have this written in the notebook somewhere, um, that maps like Black Powder were much lesser played really objective oriented yeah. maps. Yep. And I think they made this exact argument in Sweden. So I think I not only do I think what you're saying has merit, I think it actually was influential in the decision making to make but what what Bayana's saying implicitly is V two maps, V Vermintide two maps events require very, very little coordination relative to many of the V T one maps. Okay, go ahead. Zero. Yeah, I mean they already have sort of an incentive to make people play random maps with a quick play. I mean, pub games basically aren't ever not quick play, right? So they have... Uh, so, the, so they already have an incentive to make people play varied stuff. And I think that gives them an op opportunity to... Uh, sort of give people the intended experience. Yeah, like, people don't always know what they want, I guess. Where am I going with this, anyway? Uh, so... So people didn't like the the objective maps, like, uh, against the grain and the barrel uh, thing, what's it called again? Black powder. Mm -hmm. Because they required team coordination and... I think the the fundamental thing here, the issue, is that, uh, I don't know, they're kind of falling into this trap with that decision-making where if, like, the vast majority of people don't enjoy it or don't play it, that it's not good. Because, like, right. it, it is those kind of challenges and things that do force the team to play together that aren't easy and, and aren't the path of least resistance that are going to actually make the game uh, replayable and maintain a player count as the game ages. You're not going to yeah, keep people you around. Yeah, because things varied, right? Like, almost all of the events in Vermintide 2 are stay and slay. It's just... It, it's kind of like operating aren't. on the assumption that, like, people know what that... Like, dude, if people... If all people ever did was run, like, one friggin' map over and over with all the books because it was the optimal way to get loot and they had no other options, like, there were no objective-based maps or maps that were more difficult, they wouldn't keep playing the game. Yeah, but, they would be bored pretty quick. Yeah, the people who generally do do that anyway aren't here for the long haul anyway. They're the, the kind of people who buy the game and play it. They get their loot, they get satisfied with the loot that they have or whatever, finish all the maps on Legend, and then they're like, yep, I'm done. We good. Yeah, I think, that, I think it's good to have maps with varied challenges yeah. because it keeps things I mean, fresh, right? You're not going to get a map pool that has equal amounts of play. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Like uh, like the maps uh, that they added at the end of Vermintide for the, the challenge that I can't remember any of the names of. Um, the, the secret one on Wizard's Tower. Which one? Uh, uh, well, Trials of the Foolhardy. So yeah. Trial of the Foolhardy. I guarantee you that the play rate on that map was a big one because you had to do this obscure challenging puzzle to do it but two because it, it was just freaking hard and i'm sure yeah. uh waylaid is another example as well waylaid 
where the ogre bursts through the friggin floor of the inn and then you go through this that was a fairly uh, difficult map as well but just because they didn't have high player counts or whatever and would you argue that that's like the reason that those maps are they're they're bad hell no those maps are oh. friggin awesome yeah dungeons was a cool one dungeons is a really cool map but that ogre at the bat at the end with hey finale. by the way that event was Bam. a stay that event was a stay and slay but yep, it had a, it was, that was a stay and slay with a mutator that was the only stay and slay with a mutator in vanilla vermintide period Darkness. there was like a timer too if it, you didn't kill the ogre before it got to the corner it turned into done. just such a shit show so it was like yeah you had to actually master that one thing very well and it did require the teamwork because how do you do you're like, all right, I'm going to get the first bomb. Then you get the second bomb. I drink strength at this moment in time. I'll fight the dudes and cover you so you can focus the boss instead of, you know, all of us. Because if, if you all drink strength at the same time and I'll chuck your bomb simultaneously, then, you know, right. you're probably going to get screwed. There so, was a planning and team play element to it rather than just there, there everyone was. yolos and we'll be fine. Yep. There was no way to just, like, delete the boss independently. It, it had to be... And I didn't like Summoner's Peak, mostly just because you had to defend an objective, which I don't like, but um, it did require a lot of teamwork. The ogres that came out of those gates put a lot of pressure on you to, to do the DPS and to stagger your bombs and to get your potion shares correct and have the correct people with the correct weapons fighting the boss and the others covering them. Or like even on the generators themselves, the con flag casts patches on the generator while the melee oriented guy covers the guy casting patches you know there's all that cool team interplay and roles there you know what the weird thing is like thinking about well watch i would this is what i've been thinking about this whole time as you guys were talking i've been thinking about interdependence and vermintide and and actually strict dependence too think about pack masters and assassins you cannot save yourself and the the philosophy of the gunner was supposed to be was the guy who was suppressed had no choice but to hide but that didn't really work out but that was the intent right the rattling gunner yeah it was supposed to be so aggressive that the, that one person was fired like was to bait that's why he doesn't change targets when you hide behind the wall but the because the intended solution was oh, that somebody identified themselves and get pinned and somebody else takes care of it that was supposed to be what happens but they just didn't code it aggressively enough anyways the point my bottom line is that vermintide was a lot of what was supposed to be interesting in vermintide was dependence and independent and interdependence were supposed to be a thing right yeah. and we've lost dependence in events and we've almost completely lost interdependence as well. Like, I'm th but now I'm thinking about well watch and why well watch was so frustrating. What the first thing that came to mind is it sucked when your teammates sucked and couldn't even do basic combat because it was really it was very hard to carry on that map, right? But if you yeah, can carry, extremely difficult. If you can carry, that means there's no dependence. So I'm and I'm thinking that event was even frustrating when I played with good players, and I thought the reason that those events those defend objectives sucked because it felt like when you lost on those events it often felt like the game decided that you'd lose as opposed to you failed yeah, i don't know why i agree no i totally agree that because i mean the other so it's kind of like placing you on a timer and it's it's like necessitating that you deal a certain amount of damage per second which i don't mind when it's against a boss like the ogre in the finale of dungeons but i really really don't like it when it's against a an inanimate object like a generator or a pool of water. Right. It's just yeah, like, I, I, I don't feel attached to this fucking well of her. I could care less. Like, you know. Yeah. It didn't have tension. It also didn't have, it didn't have tension. I don't feel like personally, it I don't feel fear. I don't feel fear because there's these little rats chucking it buckets into yeah. a well i don't feel like that you know whereas it's if it's my like my personal life that's at at threat then it's it's a lot different like a boss now, or something like that pause why did white why did wizards tower on the other hand actually the event was usually pretty engaging that was pretty cool yeah and hard but that's oh. just that's just a stay and slay and defend wasn't it there was nothing special about it what was the difference? I feel like Wizard's Tower, you probably could remove the uh, remove the poles entirely. The whatever the the wards, you could probably yeah. remove those, and it'd be basically the same. You know what made it even better? Imagine the following scenario. You ready? 
one area gets lit up. The rest of the area gets kind of in darkness. And if you step out of the yeah. away from that ward, you're in trouble. Nice. And, but then the it's... ward starts flickering, and the guy says something. He's like, I can't hold this anywhere. But hold on, I'll do a temporary thing. And he lights up the whole map, and you can tell it's fading. And you got to relocate to the other ward and then fight again. You know what I think is an aspect maybe of V1 maps that make events so cool is the fact that it forces you to, to reposition or to move. For instance, the... Uh, the valves, whatever it is you want to call it, the event on Kazid Crow, with the guy talking over the the horns or whatever you want to call, it, and you have to hit all the valves. That's kind of yes. neat because it forces you to to reposition. Yes. I, don't, yes. I don't know what to have. Uh, the brewery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the steam room, the vent room. Yeah, the Garden of More finale. It's you know it, there's a lot of mobility in that. It's not just a stationary fight. I think so, those. Are, so that's the key. They the make key maps is... cool that there's very little reason to not stay and slay during default progression. So the game will throw yeah. more and more at you, and sometimes mobility is the answer to solving the tactical pro the problem that the AI director gives you, but it rarely is. It rarely is. Yeah. But events... Without some, without some sort of external motivation to make the player go into different locations, then you're just going to have these maps where 80% of the geometry is never explored because there's no incentive to do so. There's just a fixed path, you know, it's against the grain. All right, guys, we go over the fence, we hold the right, and we go through here, go to the barn, then we hug the left side, and then, you know, whatever, fight the boss. Then we hug the left side, then we get the tome, you know? So there are a lot of hub-and-spokes um, maps events in V1, and I liked all of them. I'm thinking um, Wheat and Chaff was amazing. You know, an event I do like Supply in V2 is uh, friggin', what is it, Nest? Into the Nest? That's the No, boss. I'm sorry, Festering Ground. You like Festering Ground. The finale of Festering Ground. The rest the rest of the map kind of sucks wieners, honestly. But the uh the finale is really cool. I like that. Because you can you can get it really really fast. But also there's the the movement options and it's not a static. I remember the uh, I think it was the Reichwald Forest, the middle event of that one. Mm -hmm. First time I tried mm -hmm. that, I had no idea what was going on. So I just like we were all like, oh, yeah, let's go over here and just hold out and see what happens. And it keeps oh, getting yeah. darker and darker and darker. And we're like, I think we're supposed to move now. <laughs> Trying to figure out, like, oh, we actually got to, like, rush through this and figure out the most efficient way to not get surrounded. And, like, where's good positioning and how do we move under pressure to get through this thing? That was kind of a neat one. Yeah. I think that is I the generally only don't like escape moving, event done well. Moving, I... Keep going. You know what's a cool V1 event is the one in dungeons where you have to grab Goblet or whatever it is. And you drop the lever and oh. all hell breaks loose. Oh, yeah, gotta, where you have to... You gotta rush uh... to the Goblet. That was really sick. There was a lot of team in interdependence there that was necessary. Yeah, where... yes. who's going to deal with the Storm Vermin while we go through here? Or, like, who's right. going to toss the bomb to knock the storm off? Are we going to rush it? Are we not? You know, where do we group, where do we group up together afterward? It's kind of cool, yeah. Because it really, mo it did incentivize incentivize you to just barrel through it, get to the little goblet, and then drop down, and then somehow get together. It was cool stuff. Yeah, that's a good event. I think it's it's not long. It's like really short if you do it well. Yeah, Zafio but used the term. It, it requires a, planning a and team play. And what what'd you say, Sneaky? What did Zafio say? I was actually misinterpreting. Yeah. I think he was calling. He was calling the item a gauntlet maybe but i was thinking it more of in terms of it's a gauntlet as in like you know a gauntlet challenge you got to run the gauntlet yeah exactly i like those right. okay so i think the reason we're circling we're circling events that require movement is again when you have to do movement you have to have a plan and you have to execute it together it's a different plan. Stay and slay is a plan, but you know it's almost it's very similar all the time, and we've all mastered it. Yeah, like stay and slay is basically the default gameplay, right? You do yes. that. Yes, all... yes. It's default gameplay, and it's really good. But events, if they're going to be anything special, have to be something other than that. Else, they're just boring parts of the map. Like if you literally removed the end event from every, pretty much every map in Vermintide Two, the maps would be better. It like remove the event and just make it default 
default pacing, the default normal spawn system. Righteous, righteous stand. Right. Every one of the worst defender is Fort Braxenburg, yeah. Oh my Just god. Like, that yeah. finale is pretty they awful. They screwed that event. It should be beautiful. That should be the best event in the whole game, and they made it so boring. Yeah, it's no conceptually yeah. built up to be like such a cool thing. It's a massive yeah. scale. It's like, a it's castle a, and stuff. And the you geography know, of that area is really good. But there's you no absolutely no reason to use it. You Drops think it's going to be nutty, and then it's just kind of, uh, uh, what? <laughs> yeah. and, okay, and we yeah, all know why just... they did it. We all know why they did it. Two things. One, they were supposed to upscale events for harder difficulties. They never did it. It's been, it's the anniversary next week. It's been a year, plus betas. They've still not taken the time to upscale events. Just steal, mm. just steal grim stuff already, but let's move on. The second thing is, they didn't want, I, I think Panda really hit the nail on the head. If you were dependent on other randoms for your loot and you are playing quick play so part of the reason you play quick plays loot everyone knows it that's not a problem i've got no problem with that but if team dependence or really high levels of interdependence is a thing people get mad and people get frustrated look at league of legends look at the, the counter strike right there's a reason there's so, so community those communities are so toxic because if your top lane is feeding there's almost nothing you can do right it's frustrating um, so, but I think Pan is right in saying that it doesn't mean those types of things are not wanted and needed in the game. It means those can't be the, the, maybe they can't be the default gameplay loop, but they have to be in the game. And now is the time to introduce them. Do we agree on this? Yeah. Hog. <sighs> that, that event should be the coolest event. And one of the, it's one of the coolest areas they've ever made. And it's just like completely wasted. It's so frustrating. Okay. But anyways, on the other hand, we should be really... I mean, everybody in the community should be really excited right now. This is really cool stuff that's going to potentially happen. Absolutely. Um, what do we feel about... So, one thing I really like... I want to go two ways. One, I think the dun... I just wanted to mention this. The Dungeon Skull event also really reminds me of the initial chain on White Rat. Where you have two choices. You have to either risk aggression... Like, risk getting worn down because there really aren't any items right and slowly proceeding or rushing as a team hitting the chain and then surviving one wave if you're good enough to coordinate that second way it's so much more efficient but you have to actually get good enough at it which is really cool to me that there's two solutions like the low risk low reward high risk high reward kind of thing yeah anyways what the hell was the other thing i was going to talk about was there another thing I may be fading. <laughs> it's totally oh 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 oh. There was there was a little bit. I wanted to talk about the um, the escort the cart mission on hunger because that like um, they stole that obviously from just like every people have, they stole that from TF2 who stole it from whoever it doesn't matter. But that was escort mm. the payload right. The payload and I move as. Well. Yeah, did we like that? I don't know if we liked how, how it was implemented necessarily in Hunger, but do we like the idea? Does it have potential? What was good and bad I, about it in Hunger? It's a it's a way uh, like it. to make the fight mobile, which is it creates tension because yeah. it forces you to progress like if you don't want to because it's a moving light source, which is clever. So yeah, I like it. The only reason I don't like it is just because. People don't know how to handle it, really. If I'm playing with a team that does it right and actually, you know, pushes with it, then it's cool. But in pubs, it's frustrating. But there it is. I mean, that, that's it. That's it in a nutshell, isn't it? Really? Yeah. I mean, there's going to be maps that are difficult and they're going to be frustrating to do in pubs because they require coordination. But that doesn't mean that uh, that those maps are bad. Those are things you shouldn't. Because if you don't include that, then it's just you're just going to have the default. Gameplay loop and all the time. It's going to get boring and stale very, very quickly. Correct. And I mean, obviously, provide an avenue for the people who don't want a challenge. Uh, you know, who do just want to like get their loot or whatever. Um, but you got to appease, got to appease both, and the people that are appeased by uh, the challenge-oriented stuff are the people who are going to stay around a lot longer anyway than the people just uh, trying to get their hats or whatever. I wonder if or they get did to level like, 2000 Omega lol. If they did something like throw out a commendation chest for 
failing a map, then they maybe they'd feel more free to upscale the events to much higher levels. And oh my god, Dan, <laughs> don't do this to me. Don't make me dig out that huge post I did during beta about the absolute essentialness of rewarding failure, so they can scale a default gameplay loop. <laughs> don't make me. <laughs> We've lost that fight. It's not going to happen. I don't think. Right. I mean, you get a slight reward because, like, you get some XP anyway, and that could get to your commendation. But it's, it's <laughs> from, not like... it, was, it was from yeah, all the people jumping into the hole on the start of White Rat for their uh, eight orange tokens. <laughs> it was a meta. It was uh... like, there's people. Yeah. Man, you give people something to cheese, they will. They will. They will do. It. Like oh, a yeah, black powder sure. was a big one. Everybody would go in and. Uh, I don't know why the hell anybody farmed Black Powder. There's no freaking books. The loot was garbage, and the time was wasted for like a loot efficiency. But yeah, they, they you'd have somebody drop in, and there were numerous cheese spots where you'd aggro the boss, and then they just you, people would people would aggro the boss and be like, "Don't shoot him." But if you shot him, like they get so angry, like, "Don't shoot the boss, man." <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, and then you had to run the map with just three people. It wasn't efficient at all, but it was it just you know. They felt like they were cheating the game in some way, so they did it. Skipper Gate, War Camp. Crawl under that. the horn. They can't reach us here. Skipping Cursed Rune Finale. I get it. Yeah, some if history. they can, they will. Okay. Okay. Just some just organizing thoughts. Hey, one thing I wanted to mention before we go, last thing. You ready, guys? Yeah. Last topic is why Last Stand sucks so much for Vermintide. Because it's static, repetitive, scripted gameplay? It's so, always the same, so you don't have much reason to do it beyond a couple of times. And it, it takes too long to get it. really interesting. It's like, uh, I don't know, it, is staring at a wall interesting? Or just it, having the same exact thing in your field of view, your visual space, for three hours? You, that fundamentally is going to make you upset. Are we talking time. V1 or V2 last stand here? They're the same map, so... Yeah, the well, there's premise. a couple of differences. There's definitely... It's a, like, like, the that, V2 one gets going quicker. Yeah, it gets yeah. interesting quicker, and it, and it has an end. FOW did it a little better, but even still, fundamentally, it's like, uh, unless you're very careful in incentivizing the player to fight in different locations, you're generally going to fight in one friggin' spot or two spots, and it just becomes very tiresome. Because you're, you're not, you know, you're just on a sensory level, the only thing you have to stimulate you is, like, the enemies that are coming at you, but just the map and the geometry are all just the friggin' same, and it's just like, I'm tired of being here. Yeah, I think the biggest problem with V1 Last Stand was you would just basically stay in the same spot for like two hours prior to them buffing last stand like when they first made last stand um they just grossly grossly underestimated what the community was capable of doing probably because there aren't really many developers and even less so at the time that actually played the game like seriously because they had jobs and stuff right You're, you can't keep up with an 18 year old playing 50 hours a week you're not going to be as good as that kid so they they released last stand and it was grotesquely easy and i remember on a couple occasions we played for three three and a half hours and we were still alive and we actually all just killed ourselves we're just like all right i'm done i'm i'm, I'm over this man like <laughs> and we all just people have to pee so let's just finish we, it we committed sud sudoku hey guys one last question in general 
So again, we've, we've really reiterated on a lot of things, but one thing I want to come back to from the very beginning, which is Pyro said one of the biggest strengths in Vermintide is the AI director leads to enough variance within a range that you get novel experiences. So it's still fun, but you also can get really good over time. Yeah, variety is Right, because, yeah. It, and, you sort of know what it can throw at you, but it can throw it at you with different timings or combinations and that leads to a lot of different situations so you don't always have one go-to plan so that keeps things fresh okay so i want to bring your attention to something and i want to think about the difference here between variance which keeps things fresh and competitiveness so i want you to think about diablo 3 the grift events and for those who don't know i'll tell you about them briefly the map is like three levels deep usually, and there's a couple of degrees of randomness. The first is what kind of enemies you get. The second is what kind of elites you get, like what affixes they have. The third is where the pylons are, the, the temporary buffs you get. And fourth is which boss you get. And there are absolutely better and worse combinations of these because you're competing with each other to who can clear the highest, the, the highest ramped up damage numbers, the highest ramped up enemies, HPs, right? And if you don't get exactly the right combo, I mean, if you're really good, you can do well. But if you're the other guy's really good too, and you don't have as good a tile set, etc., then you're just effed. There's no way you cannot do them. So in order to compete, you have to grind, right? So the problem with a lot ultra competitiveness and RNG is there always will be a best combination. And if you can't control that RNG, it'll always be a grind to execute and find the best tile set at the same time. If this makes sense. And I'm worried about one of the, I, we heard Pyro's biggest concerns. I've got some big concerns about whether the events are going to be boring, stay and slay. It's just going to be stay and slay in various rooms, one after the next, blah, blah, blah. Put all that aside for a second. I want to talk about fundamentals. Because I know the boss man over there wants an end game challenge, right? That has probably person to person comparisons. And that's cool. But we, there are huge problems in Vermintide when you make things static. It's no longer the same game. The magic in Vermintide is learning how adapt to adapt, right? So the magic in, in playing FOW was learning how to beat it the first time, not beating it the 37th time. Does that make sense for the most yeah. part? So I think yeah. there's a huge tension between competitiveness... I had exactly the same tile set, the same spawns, the same pylon locations. That's D3 language. In Vermintide language, it'd be exactly the same compositions coming from exactly the same spots at the same frequency, blah, blah, blah. Okay, got it. That means it is really apples to apples, but it means there's almost no replayability. There's almost no replayability. And I think if they had to err on one side or the other, we would err on the side of make it feel like Vermintide. Give us that, make us react, make us learn. Or, and and uh, what am I trying to say? Like, what what do they, um, what do jazz ex jazz musicians have to do? They have to improvise. Yes, improvise. That's like the magic of it. And the reason events suck in V two is there's no improv and there's no and there's nothing novel about them. Okay, so and again, one of the things you may do if you really want to have this competitiveness thing, that's cool. But make sure at the same time you use these same assets you're making to add an actual end game activity that has novelty. But I'd rather you just make the end game activity have spontaneousness, have randomness, variance within a ra learnable range, than make it completely competitive apples to apples. Do, do you guys want to comment on this? I'm gonna stop babbling. I agree. Like if they if they want some competitiveness, something they could do is have like a, a periodic seeded challenge using that framework they built, but not have the this the scripted stuff be the base, for example. Do you follow me? Yeah. I concur. Chat, you want to get any last notes in? You guys can get the last word. Pay to relay anything if there's something on your end too. Boys, I gotta go eat something. All right. Same. I I would love to play some more V1 onslaught later though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Well, I'll be here for a bit. So, if you're up, shoot me a message.